Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to the Prentice Institute brand, Brown Bag Series. Um, I'm going to introduce Glenda Bonifacio. She's a Prentice Research Affiliate, um, and she's been with the Department of Women and Gender Studies at the University of Lethbridge since 2005, after a short lecture sh lectureship at the University of Guelph in Ontario. She completed her PhD from the School of History and Politics at the University of Wollongong in Australia as an international postgraduate scholar. She taught political science, Asian history, and philosophy for 10 years at the University of the Philippines. Glenda's articles on gender and migration have been published by Frontiers, a journal of women's studies, Asian Women, Asian and Pacific Migration Journal, the Review of Women's Studies, and Our Diverse Cities, Prairies Region. She contributed to numerous book chapters on global migration of Filipino women, migration and maternalism, feminist teaching, feminist spirituality and religion as a pathway to immigrant settlement and integration. She's the author of Pinay on the Prairies, Filipino Women and Transnational Identities. She's the editor of Gender and Rural Migration, Realities, Conflict and Change, which is published by Rutledge. Uh, Feminism and Migration, Cross-Cultural Engagements, published by Springer. She's the co-editor of Migrant Domestic Workers and Family Life, International Perspectives. And she is also the author of Gender, Religion, and Migration with Vivian Angelis, published by Lexington Books in 2010. At present, she's working on projects related to global youth and migration, contemporary discourses and practices on gender and feminism, and post-disaster communities. Um, the upcoming events at Prentice Institute, I'm going to announce these now. Um, you can come back here for the Brown Bag Lecture on Friday, April 7th, 2017. 2017. The presenter will be Mickey Valley, Associate uh, Professor of Cultural Studies from Athabasca University and also a Prentice Institute Research Affiliate. Um, he'll be speaking on soundscape ecology. Um, and Steve Robertson will be here on Monday, May 1st, 2017. He's prof a professor at the School of Health and Community Studies, uh, Leeds Beckett University in England, and he'll be talking about men's health. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Caroline, for that introduction. Before I proceed with uh, my presentation, I would like to thank the Prentice Institute for the support for this project, as well as the staff, uh, Nancy <coughs> and, and the rest. And uh, thank you as well for those from the community, my students, and my colleagues, uh, <coughs> former students. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you this uh, noon. Now, I know that it's a lunch series, and you're eating your lunch. Uh, there may be a caveat on the photos I'm going to present. It might not be good in the stomach. <laughs> so, so I apologize for however you're going to proceed with uh, the photo. My topic is on gender and labor market regimes in post-disaster communities. Trans local relations and globality. Okay, um, it's kind of a new. Okay? This is a, a broader reach in terms of what I work in migration, but this also connects with a, the, a larger scale of migration, but focus in post disaster. So as usual, we start with the concepts, and I think most of you are familiar when we speak about gender. We speak about the socially constructed roles, <coughs> behaviors, expectations between men and women in particular cultures and in communities. And it's not only speaks about that, but also the power relations, the systems of privilege attributed to the gender, as well as the overarching analysis of gender connecting to <coughs> other factors or other variables of identity like class, religion, but in this particular case, the intersecting dynamics with gender is in terms of class. Okay? In terms of labor market regime, I have uh, different slides to show you the context, but I'll, I'll do the post-disaster. When you speak about post-disaster, it's not uh, after the storm, okay, after the hurricane or cyclone. It's not simply a, you know, an event, a, a situation where you actually experience an event 
but it could ac actually go as far as years, maybe 10 years, depending on the locality. So the post disaster is uh, dependent on the time and the phase in terms of relief, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. Okay, so this is a new thing in terms of uh, using the labor market regime in the context of gender and uh, disaster. I found a diverse uh, definition of a labor market regime in <coughs> economics, and there's no standard, absolute, you know, narrative about labor market regime okay, that I'm going to use for my, for in the post disaster context. Just a, a brief in terms of CCI 2009, you have the intersection of two dimensions in which you have the degree of participation of groups in the labor market and the terms and conditions in which they actually are shaped by regulation. Broadly, it includes labor uh, availability, quality of provision of skills, labor market flexibility, and regulation or, or within industrial relations. The other one is the older definition is the so-called institutionalized political organization of labor markets composed of state agents, labor, and employers. So it doesn't really make sense if you actually put that in a post-disaster context because something changes you know, in terms of how the market works. The, the other one is actually uh, used in Indonesia. You have the, broadly could be defined as a pattern of recruitment of workers, the terms and conditions that shapes the rights and concerns of workers addressed to the government and to industry. It doesn't really happen you know, in post disaster context immediately in that sense. So you have another one in the same text by John Drana Singh and Nugroho about the arrangements that includes a sort of a political, economic approach in defining you know, the availability or the, yeah, the access to the labor market. So, and when you try to go through this sort of a literature review about labor market, it's, um, the consideration there is just as a normal market, you know, like it's not in the context of a disaster, okay? what's actually available now in that bridge in terms of labor market. So the additional context there is the regime. So a regime, politically, would be synonymous to a particular dispensation that actually uh, has the authority to produce a particular policy or not. So it's a regime. When you put that in a context of disaster, it has a different meaning from what's actually available in the book, in literature, okay? Now, my approach for my presentation in this uh, in, in practice would be the use of photo history. The use of photos to present uh, the sequence of events. And I'm going to probably give some time in terms of building the context and provide some sort of connections between this world and outside you know, of what we are actually uh, confined in Lethbridge or Canada. And I believe that by showing you these photos that speaks about you know, the phenomenon I'm talking about, I believe it cuts the deepest in understanding the phenomena. So in other words, if I show you a photo, somebody said, images and photos speak a thousand words. So probably if I showed them to you, I would be silent for an hour. <laughs> okay, so what I'm talking about is a super typhoon Haiyan, local <laughs> name in the Philippines was Yolanda, okay? So there is an international code name and there is a local name in the Philippines. And this was in 2013, okay? And I'm, I think you're all familiar with this, it's just in recent memory. Okay, so this, is the, this was the strongest typhoon ever to hit landfall in human history, recorded, okay? It's three times the strength of Hurricane Katrina. So if Hurricane Katrina has actually devastated, you know, the spot United States and the uh, response, the relief, you try to imagine that in a country in Southeast Asia with the lesser access to resources. So the so I call it, you know, for those who haven't maybe grasp about the, the 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 strength, we all know about the Chinook winds in in Lethbridge. So you have the Chinook winds plus the huge amount of rain. I only survived in Lethbridge, you know, 100 kilometers per hour Chinook with my bag, heavy bag, in place <laughs> on the ground. So <laughs> here you have about 
355 kilometers hour sustained wind, okay? And that's, uh, it qualifies as category five. Actually, at the time, at the scale, they said, according to some reports, they haven't uh, described, you know, category five yet. So this actually broke the barrier, okay? So in terms of the width, you know, the span of the typhoon, the super typhoon, in terms of size and comparison, this is the United States, and that's the Southeast Asia. You have covering Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Laos. So it developed into a tropical storm and a severe storm, and once hit, became stronger and stronger and stronger to become a super typhoon and hitting November 8 in uh, Eastern Visayas. So if you try to put that in magnitude, it's actually from Florida, Miami, Florida, up to New York. That span of the typhoon, okay? In terms of satellite, that's your picture. Okay, Vietnam, Haiyan, and the measurement of the strength of the typhoon has actually changed. It's now by satellite, and others, I think, they have a different <coughs> measurement. But this is how it looks in satellite. Okay, so it hit, you know, where I was born, or where I'm at, for the, how many years. The Cloban City, the province of Leyte in Region 8, covering Leyte Summer Islands, so in the eastern Visayas. So this is, was the, the so-called eye of the storm in this path. So the Cloban City, and you see the predicted path of Haiyan. Okay, the, I think I'll tell you about other stories later on. Okay, so this is Tacloban City, that is the capital city of Region 8, Samar and Leyte, the two islands combined. Um, we have the other islands here in Central and Western Visayas. So Central Visayas would be Cebu City, and it's in, you know, Philippines, if you are not familiar with, has over 7,000 islands. So uh, it's grouped into Bigger islands, you have Luzon Islands, uh, the Visayas Islands, and then the Mindanao Islands. So, uh, in a population of 100 million or so, maybe four times size of China. So, this is uh, the <coughs> aftermath of the super typhoon. Okay. Before and after shot, okay, it's literally ground zero, it flattened the city. So, just imagine the havoc and devastation in terms of infrastructure, lives, uh, impact to communities, okay? So this is uh, interesting because uh, up to now, there is still a debate on the number of death. Officially, in January 2014, it was 6,190 official, okay? The estimates of over 10,000 was actually believed in many in, in Visayas Island because they actually um, distributed about more than 10,000 body bags. And nobody in whatever would actually get more body bags for no reason at that time. Uh, the other political dynamics in the sense is that uh, uh, they wanted to maintain the number of be uh, uh, below 10,000 because when it goes to 10,000, the United Nations will take over. So they they want to make it less than 10,000 because that's what they said. The what I'll try, what I'm going to discuss to you in between this is that you have a people who have the they call this. This is kind of difficult for me because I'm also I'm talking about the people that actually were affected or my people. So if you look into the situation, they they experience a massive, huge you know, destruction that never been. Um, seen in the history of the Philippines, for that matter. The worst is after the storm, they suffered a political disaster when the distribution and relief was actually politicized in the sense that uh, the political leadership at the time, even during this time, was under a political family that was not in the in same party with the national government of former President Aquino. Okay, so, uh, this is uh, my sister-in-law died in the storm. The friends and family, so many. Uh, my brother also died uh, months after because after the storm, you have uh, where are you going? You know, the system of cleaning up was uh, simply burning. 
like about a year, you know, the city was burning, burning about the debris. Where would you throw them? There was uh, political inefficacy and leadership in that in that in that sense. So some of the photos here were provided by uh, my family members. So you have uh, photos by engineer Bonifacio at that time. He was a city engineer, and then. The others work with the government and provided some of these photos. Of course, you can see many of those uh, photos online if you just check. So this is the, the extent to which a destruction um, occurred. And they say, oh, if Philippines experience about 20 storms or 20 typhoons a year, there's no difference with the Yolanda. But the way in which this was actually relayed, according to my respondents in in Leyte was that uh, a day before the storm, there was supposed to be, a, there was this uh, disaster meeting. The, the agency lacking in a disaster meeting was the weather agency. And then in the national network, you have there the idea of a storm surge, you know, like when they actually speak about the storm surge in the context of uh, what happened in other islands, it's simply a little bit of splash, you know, into the into the concrete, there's nothing to worry about. So in the representation of the storm surge, it's not the same as what's actually what people understood. If they've actually said a tsunami, they would have understood the context in which the super typhoon Yolanda would bring. So you have a, a storm surge of up to about maybe three, the uh, building high, over 50, something like that. And just imagine Vancouver. Vancouver would be, would be like, like eaten, you know, by Pacific Ocean. The same thing happened you know, for three hours. You have massive. So everything that along its way was uh, destroyed. And then going back to the, to the ocean. So you have here the schools. You have here the church. Uh, so totally flat. That's it. So this is uh, my research. It's about what is the labor in ground zero. When everything is flat, you know, it's actually like, uh, but they say, a new normal. So the strength of the super typhoon is considered to be the new normal. How do we respond? So my question is that, uh, what kind of labor, you know? How did this all rise when this happens in ground zero? Nothing, you know? The infrastructure is gone. The government, the local government was really uh, crippled. They didn't even respond, okay? So, and uh, yeah, it's supposed to be the exodus to other islands if they're able to. So. We have mainly Cebu and Luzon and Mindanao. <coughs> in terms of relief, you know, of the cleaning up, uh, it's all, it's unlike here, you know, in the Western context where you have, for example, a disaster. You have evacuation of people and then another group would actually clean up and then usually people would return and those affected would undergo a separate you know, trauma counseling and then you go home as if nothing has happened. But here, it's, uh, you ha you're affected by a disaster, you have to clean up, you know, you have to be with that, you know, and deal with the um, stuff, okay? So November 14, you still have reports that many of the relief are still to be distributed. So imagine there's a week that there is no food, everything done. My sister said that what they did, you know, when all the water subsided, they had to scavenge for food. So whatever is found in the debris, they would find, you know, they find uh, canned goods and whatnot. Nothing, you know, to do it. So it's actually, uh, yeah, it's really ground zero in a sense. And uh, the outside world, you know, was, uh, responded dramatically. But those uh, relief, you know, and assistance were not directly given to the people. It was just there, like on standby because of political bureaucracy and others. So the, how the world responded was, was really uh, amazing. However, to actually give it to the people in need, you have the, for me, the most dumbest blunder of all is the inhumanity of some of those who can actually understand the strength. You know? So while I'm watching CNN, I know that my family is not counted. They're, they're waiting about a week after you know, you're, you're able to find where your family are because they're all washed away and find ways. So it's really heartening to look into. So over a month, there was a call for people to go back to work. 
and for, good, for kids to go back to school, simply to count who is alive, not who is dead. And then you'll see that you're, you're about to report to your office, you know, like in Lethbridge, and then you go to the office, you have to clean your office, and then, you, you know, you have to deal with the death of your own family, my whole family gone and disappeared. You have to go to the office, you know, and clean. Imagine, you know, the kind of tragedy that people have to undergo. So trauma counseling is nothing. So you actually go back to work in process healing mode. Okay, so aside from the natural disaster, the health implications of those is still not measured, okay? And uh, this is the bank, how the bank work, like two months, three months after, just to ensure that the money flows into the people. Bank service provided by photo. School, no lights, so about six months, no light, okay, electricity. So, but and yet you have to go back to school. So it's, um, you, you can find many photos about having class with uh, an umbrella, having class, you know, the, the, the kids, uh, um, they were sitting on top of chairs and tables because it's still with water. But they had to go back to, to school, you know. Like, then you go out and you see all this debris. There's really uh, amazing in terms of health consideration and psychological. It's still not yet measured. It's mostly ignored in a way, okay. So this is how the school work, you know. So whatever is left from the books in the library, they have to dry it up in the sun. And uh, some schools are also, such the students go to school, also live in the school as part of the evacuation center. Okay, about uh, over 100,000 households uh, gone, okay. Uh, this is uh, the protest uh, against, we call it people's search against the government because of the, the billions of dollars that actually donated that wasn't given to the people that actually affected. And uh, about uh, three months or so, maybe three weeks or so, you have many agencies already understanding the dynamics about the distribution. So here, you already distributed uh, the, the stuff. And then because of the government uh, system, it has to be in one distribution center. And one distribution center, instead of really giving to the people concerned, you have repacking of the distributed goods. So when they repack the goods, some of those were just pick and pick, you know, by others. Oh, this is good for me, and then all all the rest given to the pe to the people affected is um, uh, local goods. So you have uh, imported goods replaced by local sardines. So my brother said before he died that uh, for six months, what they, they only ate sardines, sardines blue, sardines red, sardines in something, you know, everything sardines because they don't want to eat the fish because. Uh, it's uh, the bodies are also still floating. Two years after, it was still bodies being uh, washed away. Going back to the number of deaths, it's because the system of identification is not the same in Canada. Many of those who are not identified were not included in the list. So that's something that's different. Okay, um, I'll talk about this maybe in your questions later. But so in terms of translocal relations in Ground Zero, what occurred? You have in the other islands or towns, you have exchange of goods and services. But what's actually disappointing is that the so-called law of supply and demand in desperate times is uh, really, you know, cuts across uh, greed. Apart from genuine humanity for others, it's also that greed about instead of uh, 20 peso coke or what, what not, because that's the only one that's actually good to, to drink, it becomes 100 peso, okay? So it's really a matter of who can afford to have the money to go, you know, walk miles and then buy this in, a, in the neighboring areas. So also you have the entry of Muslim traders in the south. So they actually replace, you know, the broken grocery, the destroyed groceries. So these are the, going back to the so-called barter trade in, in a way that you have think them coming in to facilitate, you know, the exchange of goods and services. <coughs> Um, we'll talk about that later. So in terms of what I find is important is that because we form part of the international community, there's a very strong you know, international aid that went through after, after a time. However, there's also, there was this corresponding rise in labor wages in terms of competing who's going to do what. So initially, if you were a carpenter um, earning $100 for 100 pesos, for example, during this time, at the relief and rehabilitation, 
because it's an international standard, like UN, uh, uh, other organiz international organizations, they can afford to pay you like 500, 500 pesos, 1,000 pesos. It depends on what kind of work. So in the, for others that actually may need the labor, they cannot compete with what the international organizations are providing. Okay? So uh, ironically, you know, many of those uh, houses and whatever built faster were those for the international aid community who stayed there for a year or two years and whatnot. There's also uh, that different actors in the sense that you have individual and private endeavors going. And I'm very, I'm, I'm kind of amazed at how young people responded, you know, how young people all over the world, uh, Germany, Alberta, you know, students from Canada, I met them in the airport, they were going to donate their time to help, you know, rebuild, you know, areas. And it was a summer and it was something like, yeah, it was a summertime. So international students go in there to help, they form all these different, uh, different networks. So in this particular ground zero, you have private and public. And what occurred in terms of efficiency and faster, faster, what they call turnover and probably more accountable methods was done by private. Okay, I'll show you a photo of the difference between what the government did and what the private did. So these are also multilateral acceptance. So Lethbridge is not, Lethbridge, we have here members part of the global medic. And they, they provided assistance and training after the, within a month into the area, providing some relief and training for fire. And uh, we are included in a sense in terms of how all these are shaped into the labor market. So she works here and <coughs> very glad. What are the response? from the schools there was the request for books. How are we going to continue your studies if there are no books? So just one request from a colleague there has uh, actually spring off to a project that the whole community in Lethbridge has been involved. So we put up the Read World Foundation and some of those that are doing, I have there some um, material on, on, on that to respond to uh, they use books, you know, the books is actually discarded into recycling. And because the Filipino school system uses English, it's uh, very easy to actually uh, relate to the libraries that's actually in need of these books. So that's what we're doing aside of uh, that. So uh, in terms of building a context about the, the research and how I actually wanted to know more, um, I brought 14 students 19 months after Yolanda. So you see from the earlier photos, what, what what's the photos now in terms of transition 19 months after the super typhoon, okay? So this is uh, the government settlement area. So thousands of people still live in the settlement area. Um, housing, you know, what not, <coughs> allocation was still not uh, fully uh, released as policy involved. So you have a student there, you know, so you have uh, a number of uh, ag agencies there. This is the private. This is by private efforts. The Kapusa Network, okay, other villages. There's still no water there up to now. And then it made a playground by some young kids, okay, the water holes. Ship still on land. That's 19 months after. Public areas cleaned but not restored, okay. Uh, debris still piled. That's 19 months after the storm. Okay. Uh, so they were creating a memorial. Those still are all over. Thousand trees. And the sense of normalcy at the time we were there. So they had this uh, toned down Pintados festival to celebrate, you know, the feast of Santo Nino. Uh, also for the blessings of life. Many of the so-called restaurants. This is a farm. Rafael Farm returned to normal. The malls opened, and a little bit of calmness for now. So, my research, 2016, was 2.6 years, two and a half years after Yolanda. So the questions raised there: What type of labor market, you know, arises post disaster? Whether gender is a factor in the availability in the participation labor market for those households left behind. And whether, you know, the labor market constructed is based on gender. Okay. 
or the demand provided for is based has uh, implication in terms of gender. So I think these methods, um, combination of participant observation, ethnography, and focus group discussions, urban and rural areas, as well as uh, key interviews with development planners and local leaders. So you have uh, multiple ways in which you look into the situation. So what I'm trying to draw more here is the significance of the research. Because I, I argue it was the first time that there was a study on the ground using multidisciplinary feminist perspectives. And the issue really bringing into the discussion the centrality of gender in post-disaster communities in terms of relief, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. The impact of national disasters, national disasters in terms of population movements and labor participation. And more importantly here from outside, Canada and the international community response to natural disasters shape the way, you know, the, as Canada and the world, you know, are interveners in terms of shaping the labor market regimes in post-disaster communities, okay? And just for adding more, 99% of the people affected by natural disasters from 1978 to, to 1970, 2008 is outside of North America and Europe. Okay, so this is a, a huge thing to actually consider in terms of research. And um, people most affected by climate change live in coastal communities and in poor countries. Okay? The threatened island nations because of rising sea levels, global warming, you have uh, island nations most vulnerable. Okay? So this is uh, Kiribati. This is formerly where their houses were located because of rising sea levels. It's gone. The yeah, entire country, we're not talking about the next 20 years for climate change to actually policies to in effect. Talking about the now. So entire countries would be wiped out, island nations, because of climate change. Now, okay, in 2009, you have the first underwater cabinet meeting by Maldives. So 2009, to actually design a declaration for climate change. But uh, what are we doing at this time? You know? So imagine North America and Europe are so-called the leaders in terms of shaping policy for environment, environmental protection. Because uh, we are not that susceptible to those over there. And uh, the evidence of uh, how natural disasters work through the economies, particularly labor market, from the study of Kurt Berger in three years ago, is very scarce. So I, got, I find you know, that the topic that I chose very significant and relevant in the context of you know, uh, replication to other areas when you think, speak about the only world that we live in. Okay, so in terms of post-disaster labor market regime, which I cannot find a definition or framework to put that in the post-disaster context, I sort of now and you know, sort of provide an alternative definition. When I speak about the post-disaster uh, post labor market regime, a, kind of, a type of labor market created locally out of a natural disaster in which participation is contingent upon available resources, whether it's domestic or foreign, and it shifts accordingly from relief to reconstruction. And I'll show you how it worked out. Okay, so I think you know that. Um, I learned. So this is mainly agricultural, fishing, uh, urban areas, Norman Sea. The memorial now is uh, fixed. So in terms of post-disaster labor market regimes, local context, you have there individual and the household. The individual in terms of the, the type of work, you know, the type of demand for cash for work programs facilitated by the government as well as initially by the Chuchi Foundation and it's an international NGO. Then later on the government followed livelihood programs and the household in terms of the cash for work program and the household involved in resettlement areas to construct their, where they're going to transfer. So you are in resettled areas, temporary housing uh, that, that you saw, but you are now going to work as part of your, of your uh, house. So you're going to be part of, the, of building the area where you're going to live. Imagine. So you just, you just simply wait you know, for somebody to construct it, but you're actually part of the how household are created. In terms of translocal, okay, different islands, different communities, so you see this sort of regime of individual regardless of qualification, professional regime in terms of those with qualification, then organizational set by agencies, whether domestic or here mostly international. So what kind of labor, what kind of labor 
is, is um, available and who participate in that, whether a household would be uh, particular in terms of male or female in that sense. Okay. Post-disaster international context as uh, shapers of the labor market regime, you have this diversity. You have bilateral and multilateral players noted by the participants. Canada is there, I'm proud of, you know. Canada is there, UK, US, Germany, South Korea, China, Switzerland, and the rest. And an organizational uh, uh, regime provided by supranational organizations like the UN, um, you have NGOs, you have International Rotary Australia and Rotary Singapore, something like that. And another one would be the mission work on philanthropy, mostly by private. So you see that when you, you have, you know, the gap not provided for by the government, you have this, you know, kind of support from the outside, from the private, simply because they're connected, it's people to people connection, which is uh, um, visible in, in this time. So international agencies, you have here a number of those. Um, Global Medic, there, World Health. So these are all noted by the participants who are actually visible there. Uh, globality, which is a use for my paper topic. Globality is a phase as used in, in business. It's what they call a f the end phase of globalization. However, when it's actually used, when you use the concept, for this paper, for my research, it actually I appropriated that in the sense that it speaks about competing with everyone from anywhere for anything, okay? Because it's ground zero, you know, and anything is best, whatever is available, okay? So what's what's out there? There's no regulation, nothing, because the market is just basically infinite. So post-disaster areas are, I argue, are genuine open markets. The government's in distress, very slow to respond. You have us, uh, yeah, and then uh, people very willing to actually do more from whatnot. Gender and labor. Interestingly, because Philippines has no uh, rigid you know, or strict culture, uh, cultural prescriptions on gender relations, uh, gender equality, okay, women tend to work equally with men. In terms of projects, okay, for the household and for particular organizations, it's actually set. There is gender complementarity with the task. So for the heavier load, it's uh, the men will do that. The lighter load, the women will do it. But uh, it's not because uh, you know one is more than the other. And in terms of the wage at this time, post disaster immediate, you have gender wage parity. Okay, so these are the gender dynamics. If you look into the immediate, the aftermath of disaster, and then the re relief rehabilitation stage, and then you go to the reconstruction phase. So from the immediate immediate context, you have gender division of labor to secure property, okay, and then collective economic exchange for survival. So different, you know, household units trying to exchange, you know, whatever they have. So one has labor, one has rice, one has something, they exchange that. In terms of relief and rehabilitation, you have gender division household as well, gender equality in wage labor. However, two years after, or about three years, when you speak into reconstruction phase, you have the normalization of the labor market. You have a tendency for gender inequalities in terms of wage. Interesting, okay? So gender, not an issue according to the respondents, you know, to the general claim respondents. Now, this is more important to me, okay? This is my last bit about family's reflection. I'm a family's researcher, so what's my reflection of being an insider and outsider? Okay, so these are all my, my connections. I can speak about simply because I am the researcher here, or I'm a scholar, I'm always, part of that is also with them because personally I am connected with the people involved, uh, affected. Transnational, I'm in Canada and people there, so I have more power to actually do something, uh, affect some change or contribute a little bit. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk about later on. So in feminist scholarship, in terms of uh, what they call standpoint theory, what they actually presented is more of a situated knowledge plus the action that I brought with it. Okay. So I leave you with this uh, quote that I actually, disasters are turning points in our lives. They teach us to value each moment, the moment is day, to make us stronger for the next one. Thank you.